Hi, I'm Matt Gerdkin, East Asia Analyst at Stratfor, and I'm here with Karen Huber, the director of our Latin America analytical section. She and her team have just finished writing a three-part series on Venezuela and its energy sector. Uh, Karen, I'm really curious. O only a month ago, uh, you saw across the world big protests in Ukraine, which of course ended up with Russia seizing Crimea and a very dramatic standoff with the U.S. Big protests in Thailand, which have, have just recently started to flare up again. And we also had, at that time, uh, big protests going on and, and kind of rolling instability in Venezuela. Uh, what's the status of the turmoil there? Uh, because obviously that's got energy uh, uh, people all around the world uh, concerned. Yeah, so at this point, we've actually seen the protests die down a little bit. The government's made some efforts to uh, at least approach the idea of negotiations. They brought the South American uh, political union, UNASUR, to uh, sort of start the conversation about mediation. Uh, and we'll see another delegation come to Venezuela April 7th. In the meantime, police have been cracking down on barricades in Caracas and other major cities in Venezuela. And we're starting to see the public unrest died down a little bit. Um, that said, the political issues that are at stake really aren't going away. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably see those spring up again uh, in the coming months. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to ask was, uh, you've, you've had a transition from Chavez in, into Maduro's regime, and there's some uncertainty there, uh, not only about you know the, his, his power in his own kind of institutions and, and ability to give orders, but also his ability to command kind of moral authority among the public. And I'm wondering, can you have this kind of political instability uh, affect the oil sector? Is Maduro going to be capable of working with uh, PDVSA and, and the oil sector to make sure that supply is, is uh, not interrupted? Right. So the challenge facing Maduro is that he's not Chavez. And Chavez had the moral authority, the political authority to really uh, – be a very, very strong leader to wrangle the different interests that are are throughout Venezuela's society, play them off of one another, uh, use the political tools at hand in order to satisfy the needs of various interest groups. Maduro is coming into this with a much weaker hand, uh, at, but we have seen him focus very heavily on the energy industry. So mm. um, the, the leader of the energy industry, Rafael Ramirez, was promoted to be in charge of the country's economic planning uh, just recently. And we did see them settle a negotiation with the PDVSA laborers to give them a 90 percent raise for their next contract. And so with a heavy focus on the energy industry and uh, an effort to make sure that PDVSA workers are on board with the government's plans, uh, they have, we think, taken care of some of the biggest pitfalls ahead of them in terms of making sure that they control energy infrastructure and energy output and okay. exports. So what about precedents? Is there a precedent of, uh, of domestic political turmoil uh, cutting off oil flows? Uh, preventing Venezuela from from really you know living up to its contracts with uh, with external players. Absolutely, and I think everybody who's watching oil markets remembers 2002, 2003. At the turn of that year, there was major protests that lasted more than 50 days, uh, where PDVSA workers, really the leadership of PDVSA, locked out the oil workers, and oil production plummeted and exports to the United States plummeted. Uh, it caused prices in international markets to raise just a bit. Uh, and that persisted for a few months. The impact on Venezuela, though, was much bigger. Uh, it really was a, a hardship for them to not be exporting the oil that year. It really cut into their revenue. And so the reaction from the government was extraordinarily strong. Uh, the Chavez government fired 18,000 of PDVSA's workers, 40% wow. of its workforce. Most of those people were the more highly trained engineer uh, workforce, also mm. the accountants, the managers, um, all of them that were thought to have participated in the lockout and the strike uh, were let go. And so since then, PDVSA has actually been trying to rebuild itself from a personnel perspective and from an expertise perspective. And it relies really heavily on foreign investors in order to get oil production flowing and exported. Challenge there is that the simultaneous policy was to also uh, nationalize. And so the big nationalization in 2007 really set the stage for a decline in investor interest from abroad. 
It's given China and Chinese companies uh, a leg up in investing in Venezuela, mm-hmm. but there really hasn't been a recovery in energy production in Venezuela. Um, no matter what the government is reporting, you know, production has really declined. Okay. So what has Maduro done so far to make sure that, that, that strikes are really out of the question and he doesn't have to go through some crisis of that nature? So the 90% um, pay raise that they gave to the laborers yeah. was, was really important. I think that... Um, there also is nobody in Venezuela who's interested in seriously undermining the infrastructure in Venezuela. And so we don't have the same kind of militant problem in Venezuela that you have just next door in Colombia, where you have leftist militants that attack energy infrastructure regularly as a political target. Uh, and we don't necessarily expect that to happen in Venezuela anytime soon. Everybody in Venezuela who's vying for a participation in the government or control of, of the country has an interest in that energy infrastructure existing and persisting uh, so that when they come to power, they're able to to sort of gain the benefits from it. So the threats to energy exports from Venezuela are really not that big this time around. And we can look to other periods of really intense turmoil um, in Venezuela's recent history uh, to see that that big protests in major cities doesn't really have a direct impact on on energy production. The biggest challenge, though, is that the, the sector is overall underinvested. Last question. What, uh, at what point would you start to worry that maybe the oil sector is at risk of disruption? What, what could possibly happen as a signpost? Well, we need to be looking for the new fiscal regime that the government says it's going to be announcing pretty soon uh, to see how much they're going to be able to rein in uh, inflation, shortages, things like that, things that are affecting not just consumers on a day-to-day basis, but also energy producers. So there's shortages of cement, there's shortages of steel in Venezuela, uh, and these are all affecting the ability of foreign investors and domestic actors to be able to actually even service service oil mm. production in mm. Venezuela. So. Um, um, their ability to tackle those basic economic challenges is going to have a big impact on the energy sector as well. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, we're keeping an eye on how is uh, labor morale at PDVSA because uh, challenges in uh, the unions there could really impact uh, output and also exports. Um, so that's what we're watching. Um, but overall, it looks like there's going to continue to be a slow decline in the quality of output and also the quantity of output that the energy and infrastructure is able to handle. And uh, we'll just be looking for those disruptive signs going forward. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Very illuminating. We'll continue to watch this and we'll be putting out that three-part series on Venezuela's energy sector uh, next week. Thank you.